Thank you. Um, so I'm Rob Tompkins. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I probably should go to my who is this guy slide, but I changed it a little bit. So who I am. I am Chitomke, which is an artifact of my Virginia Tech email address. The first two of my first name and the first six of my last name. So my first name's actually Christopher, if you're trying to find me. Um, I'm a committer on Apache Commons. I'm the release manager for Commons Text, um, and I do software development. I do Java and DevOps. I tend to end up in the DevOps space because I end up doing the work that nobody wants to do, and it gets the stuff out the door. And I figured I'd just put that I'm a mathematician and a logician on here, maybe? I, I did that in school, so why not? Um, oh, and pardon the minimal slide design. I kind of like minimal slide designs, but if that puts you guys to sleep, it wouldn't be the first time that people fell asleep while I was talking. Um, so introducing Commons Text. Um, I've got two goals here for what we want to do with Commons Text. Um, let me see. Is this the goal slide? Yeah, this is the goal slide. The goals are to introduce a standardized set of text processing algorithms and libraries for reuse across Apache um, projects. The big goal here is reuse, so it's kind of open-ended on how complex our algorithms get and whether or not we get into natural language processing and stuff like that because we have a top-level project that is natural language processing, namely open NLP. Um, and the second goal, this kind of pulls me into the second goal, and that's to remove some of the heavier, textier sort of things from Commons Lang so that... Um, Commons Lang stays to being a relatively all-inclusive but minimally all-inclusive library for any Java developer, right? So we want to give them a very, very solid set of tools that doesn't include the kitchen sink and, you know, a couple of sports cars. So what's the history of Commons Text? Um, in October of 2014, um, I think Bruno brought to the dev list an appetite for including the Levenstein edit distance in Commons Lang. And um, if you go out there and look, it's under Lang 591. I think that's the, the, the JIRA issue. Um, and I think the community decided that that was too complex for Commons Lang. It doesn't really fit into that um, you know, space where it's going to be arbitrarily useful for any Java developer. Um, and so Bruno and Benedict um, put together a proposal to create a sandbox component and did substantive development over two years um, to where I kind of jumped in last fall. And I was fortunate enough to have a really solid code base to work from because these guys did so much good work. And so I, I kind of picked up right where they left off. And um, by March of this year, we had our 1.0. So um, what's the current layout? Well, fortunate, if you guys are familiar with Lang, a lot of the code base is from Lang. So um, if you've seen that before, pardon, but we'll do a little bit of uh, looking at that. So the current, lay la the, pardon, the current layout for text is things that are textier than string utils. Um, specifically the stuff from the text package in Lang in hopes of um, deprecating that stuff and altogether removing it in the 4.0 version of Lang. Um, so string builder, formatable utils, 
um, string substitutor, string tokenizer, these are all things that we've included in the code base along with some extra stuff. So we've got some diff utilities that are um, under a diff package. We've got some string similarity and edit distance um, utilities. Now that, that, that brings me to the distinction between what a similarity and an edit distance is. Um, a similarity is kind of a number that indicates whether two strings are the same or not, right? But it doesn't conform to the mathematical definition of a distance, meaning that the, if you have three points on a plane, that they either form a triangle or a straight line. Um, it's called the triangle inequality, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, if you're not, you're welcome to look it up. It's a... Uh, it would be interesting if you could set it up so that one of the legs of the triangle was longer than two of the other sides. It, it, something like that. The addition of the two of the other sides. It wouldn't be a triangle then. Anyway. Um, and we've got some translation stuff specifically for escaping um, all types of text files, XML, CSV, JSON, Java, there's a bunch of different escape utilities that we have, um, and the translation package supports something that's at the top level package of text that does string escaping. So let's look at the code that we brought over from Lang. Um, so string builder, string builder is an alternative, or STR builder, excuse me is an alternative to Java Lang String Builder, which um, provides uh, better instance methods. It, because it's offering more mutability at the string level, it loses its thread safety. So um, it's worth knowing that, but it does afford you a lot more uh, subtle mechanics around building a string. And so let's look at some examples here. Um, so we're building it up with the string test and we can read from a readable as well as append and all the standard string builder methods that you would find. Um, pardon the reuse of the variable here, but we can new up another one and replace all the Bs in this string with a different string. Um, we can replace beginning from with this string and have the string continue at the index of one. So we have a bunch of different options that String Builder doesn't necessarily afford us with this one. Um, formatable utils. Uh, this, this affords you the ability to do justification and things like that. So if I've got a string and I want to left justify it or right justify it and, and specify what characters I want to use in the justification paradigm, um, I can do that. Uh, it provides control over the formatter. And um, it gives us that control over wh how, how we want to pad the string on either side and such. So um, if we look at this, we have a string foo that we want to left justify, and we want it to be six long, and we don't want to have a, a maximum amount here. So let's go through the, I've got it written down what the signature is on this. So we've got the car sequence that we want to justify, our char sequence, the formatter that we're going to use to format it. So we can pass around a formatter if we want. Um, the type of justification that we want to do, the minimal length of the output string, the desired maximum of the output string, and the character with which we want to pad it. Um, if you pass in negative one, obviously, or maybe not obviously, but that, that accommodates arbitrary maximums in size. 
Okay, so the output of this would be foo star star star, and the output of this one would be foo, and because we didn't, oh, I thought I remember, that comma shouldn't be there. Pardon that comma. <laughs> Clearly that would not compile. Um, if you don't pass in a character with which to use as your padding character, um, you just get spaces. So the next one, um, Benedict will actually talk about later, but um, I changed my example so that we don't use the same example, um, is essentially a templating en engine, okay? And um, it essentially accommodates you using dollar sign squiggly braces and a map to do variable replacement in a string, which is um, convenient. Uh, at my day job, we use this for doing content replacement in the, the, in the UI, actually. Um, so let's look at this. So if we've got our dollar sign variables, okay, in a string, and we have a values map that we pass in during the instantiation, then when we do the replacement, the left-hand side or the keys on the map will get replaced with the right-hand side here, and our output will become, and yet again, another typographic error. I left out the period. <laughs> being, being a presentation on text, typographic errors feel really, really bad. <laughs> um... So, you can also use um, some arbitrary maps in the instantiation of this. You can use the, um, the operating system map and different things like that for population of it. Um, and I believe that you can use different variable syntaxes, syntaxes, syntaxes. Um, but for the sake of simplicity of examples, we've stuck with this one. Um, the string tokenizer is a generalization on comma-separated value parsing. So it accommodates um, delimiters and quote characters and um, even ignored characters. Um, it's similar to string tokenizer with, a, with more flexibility. Um, we've, we've implemented the list iterator interface. Um, so let's look at our example on that one. So our goal is to parse this string, right, using semicolon as a delimiter with um, the quote character being the standard quote. Um, this is taken directly from our unit tests actually simplified it a little bit, but um, one would expect because we have quotes around the value here that we would get that as our delimited value, obviously. And um, set ignored matcher in this case says that if I'm dealing with a space character that I want to trim that down and have it be represented as the empty string coming out. So our output array ends up being, and ignore empty tokens, that simply says that if I have the empty string as a value in the array, I want it to remain in the array. And so we end up with what we would expect out of that, which is A, B, C, D, semicolon E, F, and then three empty strings. And again, I'm real good at typographic errors, if you guys didn't notice. This is, this is one of the benefits of open source work, is that there's generally another set of eyes on what you're working on. And so you're less likely to get typographic errors like this. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, 
this isn't actually well this is an open source project you guys are welcome the the, the project itself or the, the the slide deck is actually um on the web so uh if you guys want to see that it's come on go back to the beginning it's actually at this url so if you guys want to follow along you're welcome to follow along there um you can also find it under chitomki uh, we did formatable we did substituter we did tokenizer and string escape utils so this is that whole translation bit that i was talking about that pack package dedicated to translation um getting to and from different escapes um is what we're going for here and so we can do json escaping where you know our single quote character needs to ne needs to be escaped because single quotes are, are are used in json and um they don't represent val values in java strings or um in this case we can do java escaping where we need you know extra backslashes on each backslash um it's worth noting that uh there was said to be a vulnerability in the ECMA escape routine in that if you include the ECMA escaped text in HTML, it may render the HTML invalid. But that's in line in HTML and um, if people are needing that level of security, they might need to go to a library that um, specifically works in the security space. Um, the Java doc actually points over to one in particular um, that was suggested in the issue. We closed the issue, we moved on from that. But um, the purpose of the library is, you know, very specifically, to escape JSON or escape JavaScript or ECMA for that matter. Um, so one has to be careful when using it outside of those contexts. Um, so now that we've gone through the stuff that was in Lang, let's go over to some unique functionality to text and I am realizing that I'm way ahead of schedule. Oh well. We can talk about text after this and where we, th where we think the library should go. Um, so the, the big bit of unique functionality is in two places. One is code that I'm not particularly familiar with, but I have spent a little bit of time in, and that's the diff area. And the other stuff that I've actually spent considerable time in is in the um, similarity score and edit distance space. And... Um, so something that we implemented was uh, the longest common subsequence algorithm, which is kind of a convenient algorithm to use for determining uh, similarities between words or strings. I use words and strings interchangeably because in um, mathematics and logic, they refer to the the elements over the cleaning closure over an alphabet as words and in, in computer science they refer to them as, as strings. Um, but uh, if we look at this, one might wonder how ABBA and ABAB has a common subsequence of three, right? Because one might think that, well, Clearly, the shortest substring in common is AB, right? But the definition of subsequence in this case is any combination of characters moving from left to right with some characters removed. They need not, they need not be adjacent. So for this, ABB... B, and the right-hand side, A, B, and then the subsequent B count as subsequences, 
okay? And so the subsequence on this one's three. The subsequence on this one's pretty straightforward. Frog and fog, right? Just remove the R and, um, and it's the same. Um, Pennsylvania and some contrivance of the word Pennsylvania has a, um, uh, a common subsequence of 11. And elephant and hippo has a co common subsequence of one, uh, whether it's either the H or the P. Um, it's also worth noting that the longest common subsequence algorithm is particularly slow in that the fastest that we can do it is the order of the left hand word, uh, the size of the left hand word times the size of the right hand word. And if you're trying to do longest common subsequence across an arbitrary number of words, you start bumping up into the NP complete area, okay? So we've chosen to limit ourselves to two words just to keep people from bumping themselves into the NP complete space. Um, I haven't thought about generalizing this to an arbitrary number of words or a, a, a longer number of, number of words. Um, it's not unreasonable to think that we, we could do something like that. That, that kind of, it feels like it still sits within the space of the library. Um, anyway, so that's the longest common subsequence. If we take that and normalize it, um, normalization in the sense of creating a distance out of it, um, it becomes the way we take a subsequence and impose characters to get from one string to the next string. And that gives us a type of edit distance in that the way you edit is what drives the output of your, your distance metric. So um, if you accommodate substitutions, right, that's one type of editing. Whereas if you pluck a subsequence and insert characters and pluck another subsequence and insert characters, it's not quite substitution. Anyway, it's pretty clear that we only have to do two edits to get from A, B, B, A to A, B, A, B, and one edit to get from frog to fog. Um, I don't know what the three edits are to get from Pennsylvania to the contrivance on the right. And I haven't done the exercise of getting from elephant to hippo. But do know that we're moving from left to right. Okay? So PH and HP over here won't necessarily fit together appropriately. Um... Another one that we've got is the Levenstein distance. So if we look at this and we compare it with the results of the other one, we notice that everything's the same except for it's fewer edits on hippo to elephant. And my guess with ha I, I'm less familiar with the Levenstein distance um, algorithm off the top of my head but it wouldn't surprise me if the ordering had less to do because a sequence is necessarily left to right and um, the Levenstein distance has to do with substitutions, okay? Um, so those are two of our edit distances. We've got a bunch more. Um, I actually have that on, on, on the next slide. So what else is there? We've got a variety of diff tools under text.diff. Um, the diff algorithm in there is largely based upon the longest common subsequence, okay? And I believe that it's the Myers algorithm on the longest common subsequence. Um, I should put a reference in. Regardless, it's in the Java doc, so. Um, if you want to get into that, we can, 
I mean, you should dig into the Java doc. It's, um, it's good stuff in there. Um, we have other various similarity scores and distance tools. Namely, we've got cosine similarity. We've got the Hamming distance. We've got the Jocker distance. We've got the Haro Wink Haro Winkler. Pardon my um my my mis mispronunciation on that. The class was originally named Haro Winkler. I was like the Winkler. Anyway, so it's Haro Winkler. Um. And we've got a bunch of translate stuff that mainly supports string escape utils, but has more. There's more in there than just that. So the question is, what's next for Commons Text, right? Um, and with the idea that we're trying to do considerable deprecation of the textier things in Lang, right? We would probably want to move over word utils minimally. And I don't know how much more we could move over. Um, the boundary that, that, that I see between text and Lang would be, or I brought this up on the list serve, maybe, I, I guess it was in the fall sometime. But if I'm a Java developer that's working on, let's say, I don't know, an Android app, okay? I'm probably going to want Lang, and I'm probably not going to want text. If I'm doing, you know, natural language processing in Java, then I probably would want text or something like that, where I, I'm trying to find kind of that, that natural boundary between the two, where if I'm actually focused on doing work in text manipulation, then Commons Text is something that I would want to include, whereas with Lang, I want everybody to be like, yeah, I want that guy. I want that one just because it's really, really nice to not have to write is blank everywhere because it's an ugly if statement to have, you know, null check and then is empty. So that's kind of where I see the line between those. So um, I really want to get a 1.1 out in the next month. Uh, we talked about a 1.1. We pulled some stuff out of the 1.0 release that was um, potentially contentious in the sense that um, people were in the midst of having discussions about design and whatnot. And I, we were like, okay, well, if people are talking about the design of these components, we can just pull them and set them aside for the time being and roll out with 1.0 with what we've got so that we can actively deprecate that stuff in Lang. And then we can pull that stuff in because it's not an API change, it's a non-breaking change. We pull that stuff in and provide more tools and that, that's cool. And um, the code base now has those two things in it, specifically word utils and a random string generator. Um, and so, Rolling a 1.0 uh, or 1.1 um, isn't unreasonable at this point. In fact, I probably could have done it last week or the week before had I not been underwater at work. But that's the nature of having a day job. Um, and I'm assuming that we don't have any bugs in, in, in 1.0 and, and we don't have to roll a 1.0.1. 1. So um, that's what I've got. So we've got word utils coming in. Um, we've got some updates to it. Can I remember what the update is? No, I can't remember what the update is. Um, it has to do with re-adding a method that is in a couple of different places. It's in string utils, but the mechanics of it are more wordy in nature and the implementation is vastly different from what's in string utils. So um, it being in word utils isn't unreasonable. We could pull up the pull request if we wanted to look at it after this. Um, the other thing is the random string generator. And um, a lot of thanks go out to uh, the Commons RNG crew for putting that in there. Um, they've been doing a whole lot of solid work in the random space and the, the probabilistic space. Um, 
with the commons RNG component and I guess the, the forthcoming commons numbers component and some of that stuff, um, I kind of weighed over into the, the math territory a little bit, having come from a mathematical background, but um, my research in math was in the combinatorics on word space and, and functions that map, you know, elements out of one cleany closure to another cleany closure and how to avoid patterns in that space. Anyway, um, so that's the next thing on the list is to deprecate the stuff that is in text for the upcoming Lang release, which we may or may not be fast enough for depending upon if Benedict decides to um, run with that release sooner than later. Um, I think some of the deprecations have been done thanks to Pascal Schumacher, but um, I'd have to get into Lang and look a bit a little bit more carefully. So, um, like I said, I'm running fast. This is all I've got. So, do you guys have any questions on things? Um, I'm. Some thoughts occur to me are that. I've been doing a lot of the work out of um, the M. Lothair book on applied combinatorics on words and taking some of the more fundamental principles out of that book and, you know, writing those into the code base would be reasonable for open NLP and other texty or sort of applications or bioinformatics informatics applications, you know, have a common place for them to go because a lot of these distance functions aren't really easily findable out there in the Java environment. And a lot of people are probably implementing them themselves. So um, the goal is to have a common place for that. And so I, I, I tend to fall back to that book and maybe a little bit of the work out of um, the University of Waterloo. They've got a pretty solid combinatorics on words crew that um comes up with interesting stuff but um that, that that's kind of where i see maybe the 1.2 or the 2.0 commons text going um but do you guys have any questions on what we have here I think definitely open up a bunch of stuff, a bunch of reuse over in like an open NLP or something. If you sure. Just run the, all those metrics on any, on something more generic, and that'd be cool. And I, it seems I reasonable. It would take much rewriting. No, that seems that seems quite reasonable. Um, I mean, I suppose you would need something that implements the comparable interface or something along those lines where you can say, okay, well, this, th this is a, a list of, of items that we know how to compare. Yeah. But aside from that, um, the mechanics of going through one of those metrics is, I mean, it's, it's elemental in the sense of it's, you're doing it element wise. So no matter what the alphabet is, so to speak, you're still operating on individual characters of the alphabet, and so it, it's easily gen generalizable to to whatever has that, you know, mechanism. That that, that seems quite reasonable. Yeah. Is there any active participation from OpenNLP on Commons text? Yes. Um, well. So I know that um, I know that Bruno is a committer on Open NLP. Um, he hasn't. He he's been. I'm assuming he's been quite busy lately because he's been kind of mildly in in um, participation here. In the last couple um, pull requests that have come in, he's at least been looking at them, but he hasn't been actively contributing code on a, on a regular basis. 
So, I mean, that, that's, that's one of the drawbacks of um, being in the open source world is you never know what other people's timelines are. And so it's all, it's all just a slow game. But um, he definitely, I mean, so we have at least one committer out there. It wouldn't be unreasonable for me to probably start treading over in that space. I haven't done that yet. I, personally, I'm, fa I'm fairly new to the, the whole open source world. I, I hadn't made any open source commits prior to March of last year or something like that. So um, I don't know. I, I enjoy it, so there's no reason to think that I shouldn't tread over in that space. And if you were to actively solicit help from us, what would you want us to help with? Hmm. I'm interested in the space that I... Sure, like sure. Um, it w finding Apache projects that, that have... It seems to me like the best thing to do would be to find Apache projects that have Levenstein distance implemented in them, or you know, some something like the Harl Winkler or the Hamming distance or, or or what have you, and maybe opening conversations in those projects, saying, "Hey guys, can we standardize on location here?" And then maybe we can build the community in the sense of they're, they're thinking, okay, all these text processing algorithms that, that, are, that we've reinvented the wheel in eight different locations, how can we centralize that? Um, that's probably a conversation that's worth starting. And um, not unreasonable to figure that out. I, I know that I feel like Spark has something like that in it and a couple other projects have these implementations out there. Um, even, what was it, the, the Jockard? The Jockard distance had a bug in it where they were pointing to an implementation of the Jockard distance in another Apache project that had been fixed. And it's like, does this make sense, guys? Does this make sense? But I mean, I, I suppose that's just the slow game of open source development. So. Um, I don't know how, how many people are on the, the commons list serve. If it, it, hop, hop into the, the dev list and I mean, there's no reason that we shouldn't start that. I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, and if you think of fundamental algorithms that are in the text processing space that seem like they could be widely reused, there's no reason to not open a JIRA issue and just commit the code. Everybody, B B Benedict. Everybody. <laughs> so lot, lots of thanks. Lots of thanks go to Benedict and and Bruno, whom I, I don't think is at the conference, for um, getting the component as far as it was when I jumped in in November. Um, yeah, we really only just copied the code that was already there. So. <laughs> well, hey, hey, I don't know. It, it, it was there. Um, I don't know. I, I think that, that fundamental algorithms, if, if we don't have them, are definitely welcome. Yeah, like there's a lot of old Perl libraries that are popular in biotech space. Sure. But I hate writing Perl code, so. <laughs> um, there's probably a lot that could be brought over. Sure. Yeah, why not? Sure, yeah. That seems quite reasonable. Um, get with me after, and we can figure out where that stuff is and start moving on it. I just had a, uh, a thought because we were talking to Da Peng at, uh, at lunch, and he's from China. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering whether our algorithm also work on different languages which, which have different character sets where, for example, a word is just one, one symbol and not made up of characters. So... It makes sense at all. 
they they do and that opens us into the utf8 utf16 transition right so in UTF-8, it, so it, I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but in UTF-8 up to, what is it, 65,000, whatever the maximal is on, on UTF-8, right? Those are all represented as individual characters. And then as soon as you cross over past that into UTF-16, the characters start being represented as pairs of characters that are conjugate pairs. And... um like if you're trying to represent an emoji, an emoji is two characters under the hood. And so fortunately, um, the Java API has, affords the ability to, to predicate upon is conjugate pair, and you can do um, counting of characters or movement across characters that are these conjugate pairs. And I think that that affords us the ability to operate in other languages. Um, it still is pretty subtle when you start thinking about last character of and things like that when you're trying to get that out of a string. Um, I worked on a pull request specifically into Lang earlier this year where we were dealing with that and we decided to go with what um, the Java string API does, which um, takes a conjugate pair and counts it as one. And that's pretty standard. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's kind of where we settled on that. And um, I tend to defer to if there is a Java implementation of an algorithm for doing that sort of thing, defer to what Java does because that way we're not doing two different things and getting different results out of it. But um, there are some subtle mechanics under the hood there that happen when you're in the character space. Um, we've technically got another five minutes, but, um, I th yeah. Um, I deal with lots of different kinds of data and, uh, and the area that's troubled me is character type detection. And I just sure. find a good third party library. I can't remember the name of it, but that kind of seems like a utility that might fit in this space too. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that, that doesn't seem unreasonable. Like, like whether it's a UTF-8 character or whether it's a whatever. Some weird Microsoft formatting or whatever, yeah. Wingdings. Yeah. Wingdings. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, those, the, that all seems quite reasonable for the library. And I mean, we're definitely in a fledgling sort of space space right now in that we've just come out with a 1.0 we're trying to focus on textier things than lang so i'm i'm pretty open as to what should be here i'm, I'm not real prescriptive about what should be here I, I think that it i don't know the more word we get out and the more people get interested in it the easier it is to kind of say oh that's the direction we should go because that's where we're going um that tends to be my philosophy on, on things generally is to, you know, just be like, okay, well, what's on the plate now? Well, I've got these things. I'll do those things. I'll get a release out the door. And if we can start moving, you know, in a direction, regardless of the direction, I'm okay with it. I guess in addition to that, perhaps also like, is this English, Spanish, Italian, Russian, kind of like a stream or paragraph level, just kind of quick scan, safe, just give you a heads up. That's really hard to do. <laughs> Woo! Um, well, a naive approach, perhaps. Yeah. For, um, for those who don't have the machine learning resources. Before. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that opens the question of, does that, should that be in this one, or should, should we try to work on that in open NLP, or where is the line between the two? And 
I don't think we've actually ever gotten to that boundary yet. So, I mean, I'm open to those discussions and there's no reason that we shouldn't have those discussions. I just, we haven't gotten to that place where it's like, this seems something, this seems like it's really complex and it should go in the natural language processing toolbox as opposed to our toolbox. But I mean, there's no reason to say that we shouldn't start thinking about those sorts of things. Um, I think I'm going to let the floor go to the next guy so that uh, I'm not crowding the, the microphone. So um, thanks, everybody. I, I appreciate it. And um, feel free to grab me in here outside after this, and we can keep plugging away at the, at the new library. Thanks.